kilogram is a thousand grams, those kinds of numbers like that. You should know the metric prefixes, even though we're in America, you should still know the metric prefixes because they're so important in science and because America ain't the only country in the world. Yes? Do you need to know like uh, the Georgian unit in terms of feet then? Oh God, no. Okay. Who would use those stupid units? Oh, I mean, I we would, but still. Why, yeah, lucky you. I know, you don't use those stupid units. <laughs> That's just stupid American units that we never got smart enough to convert from back in the 1970s when we had the opportunity. So don't worry about it. <laughs> yes, I mean, our units are like the British, you know, with like, you know, sixpence and all that kind of crap, you know. It's like if you had to do it over again, you'd make everything powers of 10. So they did it over again in France back in the 1700s. And most of the world was smart enough to say, yeah, cool, good idea. And we're like, no. We don't want to do that. We want to keep using pounds and inches because that's what I grew up with and damn it, my kids should have to suffer too. Whatever, don't get me started. Okay, what next? Yes. Yeah, Newton's version of Kepler's third law. So Newton's version of Kepler's third law says that, uh, what is it? It's uh, p squared is four pi squared over g times the mass of the body that's being orbited times a cubed. But here's the thing. For A in AU and P in years and uh, M in solar masses, in those units, if you figure out what 4 pi squared divided by GM is in those units, it's 1. In other words, it simplifies to P squared is equal to A cubed divided by M which is what we were using <laughs> earlier, and that's what I would want you to use. Um, your book, in their examples, they use it in metric units where G is, where you know M would be in kilograms, and G would be 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, and four pi squared is four pi squared, and, and blah, 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 tear your hair out. No, what astronomers do is use these units where P is in, you know. Now, if something's orbiting the Earth, then you'd probably use these units, but I am not particularly interested in making you punch lots of numbers into your calculator. I'm more interested. To me, quantitative reasoning is an I can punch long numbers into my calculator and not make any mistakes. Quantitative reasoning is more about understanding if I double this quantity, what would happen to that quantity? Uh, and and so I, I much prefer formulas that don't have a lot of extraneous constants in them if it's not necessary to do that, is what it comes down to. Because that's just tedious details. It's plugging all this kind of crap in. It's not really reasoning that you're doing there. It's just being careful with punching numbers. Whereas here, there's more reasoning involved. You have to concentrate on what the symbols mean instead of, did I enter 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 correctly? I'm sure that's disappointing to you, but still, that's just how I feel. Yes? Can we do some wavelength equations? Sure, so like wavelength, like like, um, like, uh, like wavelength times frequency is the speed of the wave kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, now again, it's not like I'm just like brimming with examples here, but so but in particular, um, I mean, the stuff we were doing was more along the lines of like, um, like photon energy and wavelength and, and that sort of thing. Is that kind of what you're thinking of? Yeah, the like upside down y equals c. <laughs> five, five, <laughs> I like it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> not an upside down y. I guess way more. I know it's way more. Yeah. What 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 Greek letter is that actually? That is lambda. Yes. <laughs> That's lambda. Okay. Um, 
stands for the wavelength, right? And so, um, uh, and, and then what were you saying? <laughs> Upside down Y is what? <laughs> HC, is that the one? Equal speed of light by my frequency. Oh yeah. Um, maybe, honestly, maybe honestly with that, I, I don't think we did any examples of that particularly. If we did, um, that's just a matter of plugging numbers in, knowing what the speed of light is. And what I really want you to know from that is that longer frequency, so if I make the wavelength longer, what's that do to the frequency? Lowers the frequency. If I make the wavelength shorter, what's that do to the frequency? Higher. So if I made the wavelength four times longer, what would happen to the frequency? Okay, so, 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 it, so here, okay, so it's that lambda uh, is equal to the speed of the wave divided by its frequency, or frequency is speed of the wave divided by the wavelength. Those are just algebraic transpositions of one another. Uh, another transposition is wavelength times frequency is the speed of the wave. And again, okay, now I could do something like the frequency of a wave is so many hertz, so many cycles per second. And the speed of light is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. What's the wavelength? That's nice, but it's not insightful. What is more important to be able to do is to reason out what things imply here. So in other words, if I double lambda, What happens to f? This is the kind of thing where you're actually thinking instead of just plugging into a calculator. Looking, I sent on the wrong syllable. So, uh, anyway, um, so if wavelength times frequency is always the same number, the speed of the wave. In the case of light, the speed of light if it's traveling through a vacuum. If wavelength times frequency always gives you the same thing and I made lambda twice as big, if lambda gets two times bigger, what does f have to do? If I make lambda two times bigger, what better happen to f so that when you multiply those two things together, you still get c, you still get the same number? Two times lower. Two times lower. Or put another way, it's half as big. It's two times smaller, or half as big. And f gets two times smaller, which is another way of saying id half as large. So in other words, doubling the wavelength makes the frequency be only half as big when we double. That's really the kind of stuff I'm more interested in you being able to do as opposed to, I give you a frequency, you plug into the formula and calculate the wavelength. I mean, I could ask you to do that, but I'm more interested in these kinds of reasoning questions like that. Is, is that like the equation we did involving uh, electron volts in class? So that was a case where I was actually having you plug that, in numbers. That's what I meant. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, right. So we'll do that too. That's where I want you to actually, that's more, let's plug in some numbers to get a feeling for yeah. how much energy does. That's what I originally yeah, yeah, yeah. I was wondering that. I was wondering. I just didn't look through my like that. Yeah, no problem. No problem. It's okay to do this. Um, okay. Any questions about this? Okay, I'm gonna erase this. And so I will take off my total. No, I don't want to total. I'll just wash my coat later. It's a good thing that chalk is not toxic. At least I think it's not toxic. But I do use this because without it, oh, my hands get so dry. Winter skin. Anyway, glad I could share it with people. Uh, so the, there's this formula that the energy of a photon is Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by lambda. What did we say that hc was equal to? Convenient units. Yeah, 1240 electron volts times nanometers. 
divided by the wavelength. And we choose those units because for atoms uh, and visible light, it gives nice kind of reasonable numbers, so to speak. So example, I'll just do the one that we did before. Suppose the wavelength was 620 nanometers. What is that color going to be, most likely? What's our range of vision? 400 to 700. 400 to 700. And 400, is that purple or red? Purple. Purple, yes. So <coughs> 620 is going to be what? Red. Yes, that's a red wavelength. So that's red. There's lots of red wavelengths, but that's one of them. The photon of this wavelength has energy E equal to 1240 electron volt nanometers divided by 620 nanometers. So the nanometers cancel, and they give it in the units of energy that we like for atomic scale problems, electron volts. What's 1240 over 620? Two. Two. So it's two. Two electron volts. Ah, 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 ah. Okay, the count. How many do we have to count? Never mind. Okay. Did you guys know the count? OK, I'm just being lame, and that's why you're like just looking at it. OK, fine. I can live with that. OK. So. That makes sense? Anybody, uh, anybody want to ask something else about that? Yes? So like a, a question would be like, um, like how many electron volts does 620 newton meters? I can say, uh, nanometers, I could do something like that. Like a photon is a wavelength of 620 nanometers. What's its energy? Um, it can also be turned around. In other words, what if I knew the energy? If I knew the energy, then I would want the wavelength. Well, what if I knew the energy and I wanted the wavelength? How can I transpose this? If E is 1240 E nanometers over lambda, what's lambda? You flip them around. That's it. I mean, you can, you can, you can, uh, it's always true. If I have like A is B divided by C. To prove what I'm about to say, you could multiply both sides by C over A, right? I could say C over A times A is C over A times B over C and then the A's cancel, and the C's cancel, and from this we would learn that C is equal to B divided by A. And that's right, but once you realize that, it's quicker just to realize that you can always do this. You can just flip those around. So if, if A is B over C, it then C is B over A. So when I'm mentally doing algebra, I don't do all this crap. I just say, oh, I can just switch those guys around. What's in the denominator on one side, if I take it to the other side, it appears up top. If it's in the numerator on one side, if I take it to the other side, it has to go down on the bottom as a denominator. So what do I do here? If E is 1240 EV nanometers over lambda, then lambda is 1240 EV nanometers. And then what? Over E. Over E. That's how I can transpose that. So then this would be like, okay, if I know that the energy of the photon is so many electron volts, then 1240 over that many electron volts is the wavelength the nanometers. So for example, if E was two electron volts, then lambda would be 1240 EV nanometers divided by two electron volts. This time the EV units cancel and we're left with nanometer units. What's 1240 divided by two? 
620 nanometers, which it dang well better be because before I showed that if it was 620 nanometers, it had two electron volts. So it better be true if it's got two electron volts and 620 nanometers. So that would be just, just you know, the first case I did is I tell you the wavelength. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, I tell you the wavelength, you tell me its energy. The second case was just I tell you the energy, you tell me the wavelength. So which way you go just depends on which which way you're supposed to, you know, what, what you know versus what you're supposed to figure out. Okay, I want to see if my phone is still happy. Yeah, it's still happy. Okay, good phone. I'm proud of you. Keep on going. Yeah, the universal law of gravitation. So, universal law of gravitation says F is G times M1 times M2 divided by D squared. So that's one of my slides here. There it is right there. G times M1 times M2 divided by D squared. And so what it is saying is, here's some object, its mass is M1. Here's some object, its mass is M2. They exert gravitational forces on one another. They pull each other towards one another. So we represent that by saying, Here's arrows representing the forces. I don't like that this diagram has the arrows kissing like that, because that has no significance, so I wouldn't have drawn them like that. Um, the lengths of these arrows are the same. Why are they the same? How do the forces that they can, so the two forces, yeah, my mouth is getting dry, so I'm bad at that bit. So I bet that guy is thinking this, but anyway. Um, how are the sizes of the two forces compared to one another? Equal, right? And in fact, their, their directions are opposite. This, this is a Newton's third law of power of forces. Gravitational forces, two bodies exert one another, are an action and reaction pair of forces. They're equal and opposite. So that's why we draw the arrows in opposite directions. M1 is being pulled towards M2, and M2 is being pulled <laughs> towards M1 by their gravity. D is just how far apart they are. Okay, so this is another one of those cases where I'm not particularly interested in having you plug in the value of G and mass one and mass two in kilograms and D in meters after you square it, get meters squared. I'm not interested in having you plug in a bunch of numbers and then here's the number of newtons of force. I'm more interested in you being able to reason what the equation implies in terms of if I change one of those quantities, what happens to the force, okay? So, for example, if I double M1 and leave everything else constant, so by only, I mean I don't change M2, I don't change the distance, if all I do is double M1, to that gravitational force, that they're both equal and opposite exerting on one another. So in other words, it'll do this to both of those forces, not just one of them, because they're always equal and opposite. If all I did was double M1, what would happen to the force? Would it, first of all, would it get bigger or small? Bigger, right? If there's more mass, it ought to get bigger. That seems intuitive. More mass pulling, there ought to be a bigger force. So if I didn't do anything to M2, and I didn't do anything to D, we kept those the same, but I made M1 twice as big, what would happen to the force? It would become twice as much, twice as much. If I double M1, what happens to F to F? It also doubles. It also doubles. <coughs> if, you, if you don't believe it, I could go through this big proof of dividing F2 by F1, blah, blah, blah. Another way to see it is, 
Well, just call G1 and call M1 to begin with 1, and M2 to begin with 1, and D to begin with 1. Then in the first case, you have 1 times 1 times 1 divided by 1 squared. What's that? 1. And then in the second case, I would have what? What would G be if I don't change anything but M1? It'd still be 1. What would M1 be? 2. What would M2 be? What would D squared be? 1 squared again. So what's the new force? 2. Two. So it doubled. If all I do is double one of those quantities, M1 or M2, everything else stays the same. It just doubles the force. Make sense? Not make sense? Happy? Not happy? Happy enough? Maybe you look happy, but maybe just happy enough, I guess. Okay? Because you got other things on your mind. Okay? What about if I triple M1 and quadruple M2? And I keep everything else the same, keep the same distance. What do you think would happen then? I make M1 three times bigger and M2 four times bigger. What do you think is going to happen to the force? Not seven. Twelve times. Because you because they're multiplied together. So in other words, going back to this example, if we just make everything one for convenience to start, then the next time around, M1 has become three and M2 has become four. So it's become three times four, twelve times bigger. So if you raise M1 and M2 by a pair of factors, you multiply those factors together to see what you did to the force. Any questions? So I'm going to put a twist on it in a second here. And I'm going to erase this because the people at home can't see that board over there. Actually, what I'll do is I'll raise this and I'll it up so I can go back to this. Again. So if you're, I'm going to wait for people to finish writing. And there's the quickest way in the world of taking notes without your phone and go boom. Okay, and can I raise the other board up? All right. First of all, does the force get stronger or weaker if I, may, if I move them further apart? Definitely weaker, right? Definitely weaker. The further apart they are from one another, the less they feel each other's gravity. So, F gets weaker by a factor of how much? Is it four times weaker? 16 times weaker because why? How'd you get that? Because of that squared right there. That says whatever you did to D, you got to square it to see what happens. So F gets weaker by a factor of 4 squared or 16. It's 16 times weaker. Put another way, i.e. F is only what? as large as it was before. 16 times weaker is the same thing as saying it's only mm, times as large as it was before. So, so two times weaker is half as strong. 16 times weaker is as strong. 1 16th. The force would only be 1 16th as big as it was before, it would be another way of putting it. Or it decreases by a factor of 16. We say it either way.
And again, to me, this is, this is really what involves quantitative reasoning. Plugging a bunch of numbers into a calculator is being a robot. Being able to do things like this is where you're actually thinking about it to see what happens. Not that it can't be important. It's often important to plug things in. But, but, but when you're plugging things in, that's not so much thinking about it. It can be useful, but it's not that enlightening particularly. I mean, you can't pilot a spacecraft by just, you know, doing this kind of stuff. You have to plug the numbers in, but you're not piloting a spacecraft. Yes? Um, I don't have a question to do with this, but I have a like, equation. Go for it. Um, could we give an example of the equations that are associated with the Stefan Boltzmann constant? Or Stefan like Boltzmann, yeah. So like Stefan Boltzmann law, and uh, and then also like Wien's law. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and this is again, this is another example uh, where I'm not so interested in having you plug numbers in as seeing what happens when I change things. This is another case of that. And one of the questions in the Mastering Astronomy got at that. It said, what happens if I do such and such to the temperature of the star? What, what would happen to the flux from the surface? So um, let's bring up the Stefan Boltzmann law first. So the law of Stefan and Boltzmann says, F equals sigma t to the fourth power. Can I push this down now? Okay. F equals sigma t to the fourth power. Is my phone still recording? Is the red light still blinking? Good, yeah, thank you. All right. <coughs> F is sigma times temperature to the fourth power. So F here is the flux. And that's the energy emitted per second by each square meter of the surface. We will make more use of that after the exam when we talk about the relationship between a star's surface temperature and its surface area and the total amount of power that it's radiating on the surface. So that's what the flux is. It's how much, take a square meter of the surface, how much light energy is coming out of that square meter every second is what the flux is. And what I would like you to be able to do is, for example, if I said something like, star A as T equals 6,000 Kelvin. Star B has, I'll say T sub A. Star B has T sub B equals, I don't know, let's say 24,000 Kelvin. surfaces. In other words, how many times bigger is the flux from star B, the hotter star, than the flux from star A, the cooler star? So in this case, the temperature has increased by a factor of what? In going from star A to star B, how many times hotter is star B than star A? Four times, right? Because four times six is 24. So four times 6,000 is 24,000. So the temperature has increased by a factor of four since 24,000 is equal to four times 6,000. So the temperature has increased by a factor of four. Any questions so far? Flux depends on temperature to the fourth power. 
So, is the flux of star B four times bigger than the flux of star A because I made the temperature four times bigger? It is not. What do I have to do? Flux depends on temperature to the fourth power. So what do I have to do to that factor to get how much bigger the flux comes? Take a wild guess. Temperature is raised to the fourth power in order to get the flux. So if I make the temperature two times bigger, what would I do to that two to get how many times bigger the flux is? Multiply by a factor of two. No, not multiply by a factor of two. Kind of think of the simplest answer that could be it's t to the fourth power. Temperature to the fourth power, that's a hint. So what I do is I take the factor to the fourth power. In other words, if I were to double the temperature, the flux increases by two to the fourth power, or 16. If I were to triple the temperature, the flux increases by what to the what or what? Okay, I know you know, Let's see if that is, I, I, it's great, but let's, I, want, I want the rest of the peanut gallery to, to do this one. So, okay, so if I doubled the temperature, I would say the flux increased by two to the fourth power. If I tripled the temperature, I would say the force increased by to the three to the fourth power, which is what? Three to the fourth power. What's that mean? Three to the fourth power means do what? Yeah, 3 times 3 times 3 times 3. Multiply 3 by itself four times, okay? And I would think of that as, what's 3 times 3? 9. What's 3 times 3? 9. What's 9 times 9? 81. So if I triple the temperature, F goes up by 3 to the fourth power. 3 times 3 times 3 times 3. I think that was 4 times. It equals 81, right? If you like, you can also go 3 times 3 is 9, times 3 is 27, times 3 is 81, whatever. Or, if you want to be a real wimp, you just say on your calculator, 3, y to the x, 4, and then it'll do that for you. Um, but here I said that the temperature went up, it increased by 4 times, by a factor of 4. So now what I got to do is I got to do to the, I got to do 4 to the 4th. So in this case, so F increases by a factor of, in other words, this is how many times bigger it got, by a factor of 4 to the 4th power, that's 4 times 4 times 4 times 4, which is what? It's a little trickier, but I just know it because I've seen it a thousand times. Two hundred fifty-six. So the flux will be two hundred fifty-six times bigger. So that's kind of the punchline here: is that if I increase the temperature by a mere four times, the flux gets two hundred fifty-six times bigger, much more than the temperature went up. If I increase the temperature by a factor of ten, the flux gets ten to the fourth, or ten thousand times bigger. I'm trying to verbally kind of emphasize the fact that. The flux goes up way more than the temperature does. That fourth power dependence there says, wow, the flux is really sensitive to temperature. It really grows when temperature grows. Any questions? And I think Bean's law was one of them. Can we do one with Bean's law too? Is that true? Which is the radiation laws. So, so Bean's law. Can I erase? Can we do it? Can we do it? Can we do it? Do it? Do it? Do it? Ah! So Bean's law says that the temperature 
of a black body is related to where the peak wavelength is, or the lambda max, and we, we use both lambda max and lambda peak to mean, to mean the same thing, namely, at what wavelength is the curve that shows brightness versus wavelength? Where is the curve tallest? Where is it emitting the most radiation? So for here, this 15,000 Kelvin star we dropped down, here's the peak I dropped down, and it looks like it's um, around, uh, you know, in between 10 to the two and 10 to the three nanometers in that case, you can be more precise than that. Anyway, 2.9 times 10 to the sixth power nanometer Kelvin. divided by the wavelength where the curve has its peak. If I wanted to say what the peak wavelength was in terms of the temperature, what would I do? Another one of those transpositions. Flip them over. So lambda comes up, <laughs> temperature goes down. <coughs> Excuse me over the temperature. And then a third way to write this would be, let's multiply T over here. Let's take the T over here. We can say that the peak wavelength times the temperature is 2.9 times 10 to the sixth nanometer Kelvin. So in class, we did an example where we said the sun's temperature is 5,800 Kelvin. And I plugged it in and got that lambda peak was 500 nanometers based on that. You would just divide. You would take 2.9 times 10 to the 6, divided by a temperature of 5,800 Kelvin, and that would give you 500 nanometers for the peak wavelength. Uh, the Mastering Astronomy had another kind of example. So this, this is the kind where I say it can be very important, but it doesn't involve much thinking. It just involves plugging in numbers. The thinking comes in when we say, what would happen if we doubled the temperature, for example, or tripled the temperature, or whatnot? And this is very similar to what we had with wavelength and frequency, namely, the peak wavelength times the temperature is always the same number. It's always the same, no matter what. So if lambda is two times bigger than this, if the peak wavelength got two times bigger. Actually, let me do it in terms of temperature. Yeah, that so if T becomes two times bigger, if I heat it up twice as high, if T got twice as big, what would the peak wavelength have to do to compensate so that they multiply to the same number? <coughs> if T goes up by a factor of two, what happens to lambda peak? Correct, but let's let the, yep. Yeah. So, so if, if this number becomes twice as big, T, what happens to ha what has to happen to this number to compensate? It has to be only half as big. It has to be only half as big in order to compensate. Are you buying what I'm selling or are you, yes or no? Yeah. That was very convincing. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. So if T becomes two times bigger, lambda peak, has to become two times smaller. I.e., 